Well, hello again, everybody, and welcome to this first in conversation with a Super League legend. No, uh, well, let's just get straight to him. Mr. Barry McDermott, ex Wigan Warriors, Oldham, of course, and best known probably for his time at the Leeds Rhinos. Barry, welcome to Super League Roaring Conversation. I'm looking forward to speaking to you. Like I said, before we started recording, I listen to a lot of stuff. I, I get my, I delve into different levels or different, I think, different perspectives on the game. I think as somebody who gets a voice and gets an opinion, it's important that you represent a lot of people. Ultimately, I'm I'm true to myself and it's always myself that that is out there. But uh, no, you do, a, you do a good job. So, so I'm happy to support anybody and everybody, especially yourself. Oh, cheers, Barry. That's really, really kind of you. Right. Uh, and if you've not seen any conversation, we're going to settle you in nice and nice and easy to begin with. So first of all, Barry McDermott, who's your favourite band? Band? Uh, ooh, that's a good question. I like Kasabian. Uh, I like a bit of country. Um, I've got into country over the last few years. Um, uh, a person you'd know really well, Brazy. Me and Brazy did a Steve Prescott Foundation trek to the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And the guides that were looking after us were were obviously American into the into the country music. And from there I got into it. So I like a bit of Luke Combs, Chris Stapleton, all that kind of stuff. But if you were to push me, who would I go and watch live if it wasn't Oasis and I couldn't get me wish? Um I like Ed Sheeran. I like Ed, Ed Sheeran. Uh, favorite song? At the minute, what is my favourite song? Uh, it changes all the time, but I suppose I do like Luke Combs and Fast Car. I do like that at the minute. Man. Tune. Uh, your favourite film of all time? Goodfellas. Oh, brilliant. Quality. Easy. Okay, I know Quality. that is out off by yeah. out. Well, here's a question for you. If there was a film made about Barry McDermott's life, who would play the lead role? <laughs> I can hear Max and Paddy going off in my brain. <laughs> in it, but we'll, I'll keep them, keep them to a minimum. Who would, who would play? It's got to be the Rock, can it? We're, we're very similar. Oh, the Rock, his old cut to the bone, sparkling personality. It's got to be the Rock. Hey, not since Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito has been twins yeah. like that one. Anyway, that's a... I've heard that Dwayne Johnson actually, if if and when he does a version of him now, he wants me to play him as well. I'm sure, I'm sure he does. What three words best describe you? I like to be honest. I like to be reliable, and I like to uh, have fun. Superb. Current TV box set, Barry. What are you watching on the TV? Oh, I've just I'm, I'm nearly finished the Gentleman. Yeah, uh, which is a Netflix one, but yeah. uh, we'll have a box set in our house. We're we're distracted at the minute with with the uh, Big Brother. Right. Um, are we allowed to use colourful words here? No, mate. No colourful no. words on Super League Raw. No. Okay. I love NAF TV, so all the. Right. Love Island and um, yeah. you know all that stuff that's just everyone scoffs at. So uh, so we're getting distracted with with uh, Big Brother at the minute. But I'm but I'm one 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 episode of finishing the gentleman, which has been very good. Fair enough, Paul Rowley. He, when when we had Paul on, he said he loved a bit of Love Island as well. So you're in good company there. All uh, right, who is who it was your still first... be on Love Island roles though? Couldn't it? Well, I said that too. Was he going to be the next Keenan Brand? But he wasn't having any of it. He wasn't. To you be remember, fair. I'm going back a bit here now when Super League was was sort of the new thing, and it was always the new era, and 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 they did a they did a promo for putting beef back, on the, and they used Paul Rollies. Well, I, I think they used me and put put Paul Rollies' head on it, but he's <laughs> having it with him. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll tell you something about because uh, you've probably not seen his in conversation. Go and have a watch of that. But I'll tell you something about that later because uh, you might find it interesting. Uh, your first ever rugby league hero, Ella Realme. Yeah, quality on it. Uh, just amazing. And and I've come across something on Twitter, sort of falling in and out of love with Twitter every every other day. It seems to be a, a place for people to vent the frustration, but occasionally there's some really good stuff. And there was the guy from Wigan, but four minutes of Ellery. And the in it, it was some of his early stuff when he was playing on the wing, some of his stuff when he wore six, he played in the centre. And of course, later as a 13, he was just an amazing athlete. Athlete that I wouldn't say was a natural rugby player, but 
his competitive spirit, his edge, uh, and his desire was just something I looked as a, as a kid. I was an Oldham fan, so Andy Goodway was the first sort of first bloke that I watched that didn't have a beer belly and a, and a big thick tash. So he sort of took my attention. Then when he went to Wigan, I sort of biffed Andy Goodway off. I was like, here we go. This is the man Ellery Allen saw. So yeah, yeah, the goal to Ellery. And, and to be fair, his, his, his lad announced himself on the Super League stage this weekend, just gone as we're recording this. Leeds have just played Lee. Um, cracking try and that one that was chalked off had, it, had that had gone in that would have been even better yeah I think he's had to be patient and he's he's obviously come through the system at, at Wigan there and he's had to be patient but like like all people who have a a, a, a last name that carries weight you look at Jack Sinfield it, it goes against them more than it goes with them in our sport we sort of make them work harder so I'm yeah I'm, I'm pleased for him yeah, let's hope he gets, I mean, with Briscoe's injury, he's probably going to get a sustained run in the team. I'm really excited. Cracking, I mean, electric pace. We have a a, a a guy that comes on our weekly show, he's a Lee fan, and and he said he's Matty Ash, Ashton-esque in terms of that he's finishing. So, really pleased for for the young lad. Right, um, where are we going to go now? Right, your biggest inspiration, so as a player in the dressing room, who's been, who's been your biggest inspiration teammate-wise? Do you know, I've been really, really lucky. I've played with some incredible players. And it's not until you retire, and I've been retired a fair few years, and I go out and I talk and do keynote speaking and a little bit of charity after dinner stuff. And uh, it's not until you start talking about the players that you played with and the lessons that you've learned off them. Couldn't narrow it down to all that. I think, understandably, having spent hours and hours and hours in the car with Kev Simfield, he's right up there because of the way... He lives his life, he, you know, as a, as a human being, he's incredible. Everything that everyone is starting to see now about him has been on display since he were in his teens. So, so Kev would be on the list. I still think the best player in the Super League year, in, in my experience and opinion, is, is Andy Farrell. Right. When I played with Andy Farrell, it, he, was a, he was an incredible leader. He could... You know, he had skill, he had a little bit of speed for a forward, but he had nous in terms of the game and he could break a game down on the field and off the field and then he was fit and competitive. Um, but I think in terms of, get, you know, get people who influence you in, in, a, in, a, in a way that, that enhances you as a person, you know, people like Adrian Morley, Rob Burrow, Yestin Harris. We, I know we're going to go through me once on yeah. the team. Yeah. But so I've been very, very lucky. It's a, re it's a really tough question that day. Really tough. Fair play. Uh, so th this one might be also tough, but I'm interested to know the answer on this one. Biggest joker in any dressing room you've ever been in? Well, O'Connor was always, you know, I, I could have yeah. put O'Connor on the list because me and him are best pals. That's not a forged friendship that we've been, we've been friends since we were 15 and 16 and, and um, he, he loves a joke and never shuts up, to be fair. Never shuts up now. So you can imagine him with an audience. You can imagine him in a changing room and taking liberties. And and, and then I'd put Rob on that as well. Rob, yeah. Rob Burrow was always, you know, cheeky. cheeky beyond cheeky, liberty-taking. But he, he picked his targets wisely. He picked his, his big fellas. So when I played with him, I was his main target. When I left, it was Kyla Luluai. And he knows full well we're not going to do anything. Even if we do manage to get hold of him, we're not going to do anything, are we? So, so one of those two. Probably Rob just nudges it. Fair play. Uh, worst dress sense you've ever seen in the dressing room? Yes, Din. Yes, okay. Din Harris could wear an Armani suit that looked like a black bin liner. <laughs> uh, it, when we were playing, we we were a, a team like Leeds. You, get, you do, you get looked after with sponsors and big sponsorship deals and, and and I don't know whether it's still the case now but we were always looked after we'd get you know the best of the best but he managed to make it look like a bag of you know what bag of rags. <laughs> yeah bag of rags happy days uh, your favourite away ground to go to I always enjoyed Odso but I, but I I always thought away grounds was were a challenge me I, I wasn't necessarily interested in in the um, the niceness of it all, so you look back at places like Salford, and you look like look at 
I'm sure it's a bit better now, but places like Cast that are old and, and a bit traditional, but I used to love Odsall because it was hostile. It was always a big crowd. Um, Bradford Leeds games were always top draw, top occasions. It was nip and tuck who would win and who would lose. And I just loved it. I just thrived off that atmosphere and and that vicious venom that was that was getting thrown on you. So, so I loved it. Yeah, for those younger ones who are watching this, uh, Barry's era, Leeds Bradford, pretty much had tussle after tussle. It was a, a hell of a time uh, to be in that part of the world. Uh, the rivalry was outstanding. Um, right, uh, I think you've already answered this. Would Andy Fowler be the best player you've played with then? <clears throat> or are you going to go for somebody else? You know, I, again, it's really difficult because I've played yeah. with some really, really good teams and I've I've managed to learn off a lot of the people that have been around, but I'd certainly put the players that I mentioned in that bracket and just not not for anything other than I felt better having them at the side of me than than in the opposite team. But with Faz, I played against him as many times as I played with him. So, right. so yeah, probably, probably Faz if I was pushed on it. And the next question normally is the hardest opponent. Would, it, would Faz be that one? Uh, Who's your hardest opponent to come up against? Well, this is the question I get asked more than anything. Yeah. Um, who's the toughest? You know, it's it's that it's that typical from my era. Who was the one that 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 probably intimidated me in the way that I tried to intimidate people? Uh, and it's a guy that's died now. He's called Quentin Pongia. Yeah, yeah. Well, people with good memories and aficionados of the game will remember a New Zealander back rower played for Canberra when they were having a, a really good time, then went to the Roosters, Adrian Morley, again, as a fondness for, for Q. And uh, when he came over to this country, came off the back of finishing his NRL career, short stint in France, and then came to Wigan, and then Widnes, uh, yeah. and was spent, really, when he came to Wigan. But whenever I played against him in an international match or a, or a club match, occasionally a ball would flash past me and flash past him, but neither one of us were looking at the ball. We were looking at each other because you just don't know where they were coming from. So Q was the one that I'd put put right up there. But I, I have to give special mention to Rob because having played with Rob the, 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 more or less all the way through, I only played for Ireland against England once when Rob played. And and I think his, his strength, his courage, his bravery, you know, everything that we see now, was always on show when he wore a shirt yeah. because he took them big fellas on and, and made them look stupid. So I think the fact that he gave three, four, five stone away whenever he played a game of rugby league makes him, you know, probably right up there when you talk about toughness and mental mental toughness too. Yeah, I mean, when whenever Leeds came to town, he was the player that you were fearful of. And he was because he was just he was just rapid. He could duck under a challenge. It was a way. Um, and I think, you know, we'll probably touch on Rob a couple of times today. But I think what's important, I mean, champion, absolute champion, the way him and his family have, have been over these last few years. And, you know, our love and respect go with him, uh, you know, at this time. But we should never forget Rob Burrow, the rugby league player, because Rob Burrow, the rugby league player, was a very, very special player, wasn't he? Yeah, game breaker. Game breaker, he could... He could start the game, he could come off the bench and there was a period in my career at the back end where I was on the bench and, and every week on the bench was Rob Burrow, Barry McDermott, Willie Porch and Alela Watita. And I used, to get, I used to get really frustrated because I liked the ferocious first 10 minutes. I loved that. Um, yeah. But the, the, the job that we were doing for Leeds in the, at that time meant that most weeks, those four players, they, they, they were the first four names on the team sheet. And I'm, I look back and think I was quite quite blessed to be part of what was like, a, it was like, if you look at it in terms of picking a lock, it was a master key for everything because you had a little bit of everything and Rob was part of that and probably the most important part. Yeah, absolutely. No, completely agree. A couple of players as well that have got a bit of Rob in them at the minute. Leon Hayes at Warrington, he's going to be interested to watch. I like this Nick Arima at Catalan. I yeah. think he's going to be what what a signing he he could be. I think Arthur Morg as well at Catalan yeah. is an exciting player. He's going to get more game time this year with Tompkins retiring. Uh, like I say, little bits of Rob in those type of players. I would, I would imagine those players now believe that they can do what they the, they're currently doing because of the things that they've seen Rob do prior to yeah. Rob. Yeah, you know, I think when you think about small halfbacks, you're thinking about Sean Long. You're thinking about. 
players who I played with, like Ryan Sheridan and um, Sean Edwards, and and that ilk. It, you you know you don't you don't think of the smaller, diminutive, faster, agile players. You think of those thinkers and and people. I I remember like it was yesterday looking at this little kid turning up at training, thinking he's got no chance him. He's five foot two, five foot three. I don't, I, I, his weight, if I had to guess, it'd be sort of nine and a half stone, ten stone when he first turned up. I'm thinking he's going to get mullered, this kid. But then I soon, having trained with him half a dozen times, soon realised that he wasn't scared and and, and it actually he would make fools of, of a lot of people around him. So players who've seen Rob Burrow over 17 years of his of his Leeds career turn into one of, if not the most important player on, on a weekly basis would think, well, why can't I do it? Absolutely. And it's going to take some tries to to knock Rob's try at uh, Old Trafford out. The, I'm going to say the top 10 all-time greatest. He's probably in top five uh, at this moment in time. But that number try, one, are you going to go number one? Number yeah, one. I mean, yeah, he's going to take a lot of tries uh, for that one. To, to not hit highlight reel. It was absolutely sensational. Right. Describe these teammates in one word. You you have played with some good players. You have. There's no uh, bad language, guys. just so I understand. No bad language, no, no. Yeah. Uh, so be clean. But yeah, describe these players because you have played with some belters. I've picked a few out. Jason Robinson. Elusive. Sean Edwards. Frankie. This is a good name. Kelvin Skerritt. I want to say cheating get. <laughs> <Two words. laughs> yeah, I must admit, Mr. Skerritt and Mr. Platt at Wigan back in the day, dearie me. Uh, Andy Farrell. Inspirational. Chris Lad Radlinski. I want to think of a better word for reliable or consistent, but just the model, model of consistency. Yeah, he's done great things since he's retired as well. Wigan is a massive, massive, you know, massive bonus start for Wigan, having Chris Adlinski in the team there. Uh, your mate, Adrian Morley. Granite. Granite, good word. Uh, you, <laughs> you've mentioned him already. Yeah, yes, in Harris. Mercurial. Nice. Gareth Ellis. Pickaxe. Pickaxe. Uh, Paul Sculthorpe. Brilliant. Yeah, he was class. Uh, Stuart Fielding. Adversary, fair play. Yeah, uh, I mean, guys, I could that that that's a whole show in itself. The amount of players you play with, it could have been a list as long as me. Are we're gonna have to stop it there? Right, last part of this quick fire start to get us going. Three dinner party guests, alive or dead. Who would you invite round and why? Well, considering I like my food, they'd have to be people who wouldn't take everything that was on the table. So I'd have to choose wisely. I've always been an admirer. Anybody that follows sport would look at Muhammad Ali and think the commitment he gave to the sport, his beliefs, his religion, and then backing that up with 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 sacrifice. So, so I'd go Muhammad Ali. Love, I love a laugh. So I'd have to bring Peter K along with me, and I'll bring O'Connor because he follows me everywhere anyway, doesn't he? You'd be disappointed if you didn't write. So, uh, uh, Baz, Baz, Barry McDermott, whichever way you want to go, uh, born 22nd of July, 1972, in Oldham. Proud Oldham lad. Um, So, go on, talk us through. Who introduced you to rugby league? How did it all start? Like most people, school friends. I I went to a Catholic school. I grew up a big Irish Catholic family in Oldham, so... So church and sport was pretty much all we did and knock about on bikes and climb trees and, you know, just just generally be outside. So being outside where we're either kicking a ball, riding a bike or looking for something, some trouble to get into. So school friends and one of my school friends' fathers was was a coach at Saddleworth Rangers. I'd been watching me play for our school team. Um, and then he took me up there and when um, Matthew... 
stopped playing and Dennis stopped coaching. I had to get um, somewhere a bit more local. So Walter Ed was 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 where I went. And Walter Ed is is Paul Sculthorpe, Mark Sneed, Jordan Turner, Kev Simfield, obviously. So so lots of players have gone through through the ranks there um, at that club. And it, it was it was for me, it was just a good place to hang about with people who were who were like me thought like me, could bring out the best in me, sometimes the worst out in me, but we had good fun and and it was a, a place, it was like a haven. I think when we look at the game and the sport, we always focus on what do we need to do to bring the next Paul Sculthorpe, Andy Farrell, Kevin Sinfield into the top tier of the pyramid. I don't think like that myself. I think it's the bottom of the pyramid and it's the people who just end up being a little bit better. They might not have a, a, a mum and dad stable unit they might need a strong male role model or now we've got the girls it might it might be that you know the girls teams by a girl coming in she she learns to socialize a bit better she she can communicate with people so I've a lot I've a lot to thank rugby league for and I've a lot to thank my early upbringing Oldham's a, a lovely place it's got its troubles it's got its issues but it's multicultural we learn how to deal with different religions different um, languages even in in a town like Oldham, so so I'm very blessed. I'm very lucky. I, I grew up on the rough side of the town. I currently live on the nice side of the town because that's what rugby leagues give me as well. But I'm thankful and I'm grateful for for a loving family and a mum and dad that that you know that really really drove home the morals, the values, the principles that I lived my life by now. Superb. I mean, I say this to to any kid that's watching. You, you know. The sooner you join a rugby league family, local community team, as Baz says there, you know, in terms of your socialisation, you know, friendship groups, you know, how to communicate, all of these things. It, the rugby league family at every level is a very special place, Barry, isn't it? And I think the two words that, that are, are front and centre are, are discipline and respect. Discipline yeah. for the people around you, discipline for the people in charge. And then respect as well, respect respect for the environment, the coach, your teammates, and ultimately the referee. I think I don't follow the round ball game at all. I haven't no, I haven't no. since the back end of the nineties, since I, I live in, in a nice part of Oldham. Paul Scholes just, just lives at the back of me there. And I am stopped oh sorry, I haven't watched a game since since his lot stopped because because no. I I can't really associate with the way that, that game is played, but our game as long as we keep those things, as long as we don't lose the, I would say the the fundamentals of our game, which which is play hard, play fair, try not to cheat, uh, and if you do cheat, hold your hands up and keep your mouth shut. Yeah, I mean it's interesting because on one of our programs in the sheds, I called it out in the first couple of rounds. There's a couple of players that for me were milking proper milking, you know. So, yeah. Like if you, hear, you hear football players get a tap on the ankle and they scream and do the roles. We had a couple of them in the first two rounds where players were screaming in the tackle and you're thinking, no, 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 this isn't rugby league. We're not going down that road, are we? And I think that's that's a consequence of of the way yeah. that we started the season with with the rules that they're still tinkering about with. We won't we won't go down that rabbit hole. But when but when a player feels something around about here, he'll give out a verbal, he'll give out a yelp and he'll stay down because he knows at some point with all the games being filmed now, with every camera that's there, with every uh, doctor that's over the side checking everything and everything, it's bound to get something and it's bound to get a reward. And I'd, I'd like to think we need to just just take a step back and say, right, well, let's play it in the, in the same way because... I believe you, you you give out what you want in return. And if you give out that kind of stuff and you play like that, then don't complain when somebody does it to you. Absolutely. We had Mike McMeekin on and, and I said to Mike, the players have the players have a responsibility in the dressing room to stamp this out in the teammates yeah. because yeah. you know, and Mike said, I said to Mike, I said, you know, one of your teammates did that. What would you say in the dressing room? He said, Well, I'd be telling them not to do it again. And we need that. You know, it needs to be policed in the dressing room. That's part of the game for me. Yeah. There was a guy that I played with when I first joined Oldham said, you, you, you're you part of this now. Your part and your responsibility now is to hand it over to the next generation in a, in a better way, in a better state. And at the time, I thought it was financially. I thought when we were going through Super League and everybody went full time and 
I began my career and I was a part-time rugby player. Then I became a full-time rugby player. Then I've just about crossed into the space where they were becoming athletes and full-time athletes. And, and very much now, you know, the, the modern day rugby league player is a lot different. I'd say 90% different than he, he was when I was playing, but there's still that 10% because we're all brought, brought up in the same sort of areas, the same demographics. We're still fighting our way out of our predicament. Whatever council estate we're from, we want to better ourselves and, and be the other end of town rather than the place where we're, we're born into. Yeah, we were talking just before we come on air. You know, Is there a better athlete in a sporting arena than a rugby league player? I mean, I know we're biased, but they just don't compare, do they? Anybody no. else to what our lads do? You've got to be a master of everything. And, and, I, and I look at... So I'm a big UFC fan. I like I like I like my combat sports, and I don't I don't apologise for that. That's that's my preference. Yeah. And I would look at, you know, I'd look at boxing, and I'd equate boxing to, to um to rugby union, and if if rugby union has rugby league, then boxing has UFC, and UFC is is a, a mixed martial arts arena. We are mixed in everything that we do. We need to be able to pass, kick. When called upon, I'm not okay. saying drop forwards, yeah, yeah. stand yeah, yeah. back, my kick. You know, we we need to be called upon, or we need to deliver when we're called upon in in every single aspect, every single discipline, every t single art form there is within our sport. And and um, rugby league players now, I think, have a have a better balance in their life. They very much focus on health and well being. And and in 2024, we talk about mental health more than any other time that I can recall, but they spend more time going through what's going to get them fit for the weekend, but also it's going to keep them balanced during the week. Yeah, and and it's great, and and, and so they should as well, uh, because, you know, again, uh, you're back in your, probably even in your era, you know, when, when the retirement came, that was it. They were on their own. And it's great to see these pathways now open up. I was speaking to Ollie Partington uh, yesterday and he's he's studying uh, to be a mortgage advisor as well as playing rugby league. It's great that the sport is, is doing that type of thing uh, and long may that continue. Right. Actually, you know what, Barry? I didn't know this. I didn't know this. But research for this interview with you, I always thought that your eye had something to do with rugby league. Naivety. Right. But it didn't. Explain to us what happened to your eye. No, at the age of 15, I was going to join the army. At the age of 15, I went onto a, a, a piece of uh, spare ground, was messing about with a with an air rifle, going it a pellet ricocheted off a bottle, went into my nose and blinded me at that at that point. So that was 15, um, just before my 16th birthday. I was going to join the junior army, travel the world, meet people, and experience life and cultures all over the world. And ironically... As a rugby league player, I've travelled the world, I've met new people, and I've experienced life and cultures all over the world. So, so there's a, a lot of parallels. I don't think at that point in my in my life in in um, 1987, I thought I would ever get to be sat here and 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 be, um, I think, thoughtful of of that point of my life. But many people have asked me, have, have said, would you go back and change it? And I wouldn't because. Everything that's happened to me has been from that point, and it it was definitely a turning point in my life. I wasn't, I was reckless with with a lot of the things, and family wasn't as important as it was to me now, or it is to me now. But the people that stood by me and people that were around me were my family, and and that's what that's what my home looks like now. That's what my kids' homes hopefully will look like. That. The people around you, when 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 you're in trouble, they're the ones that matter. So it was a driving force for me. It wasn't something that held me back. It was, I've always had that little part of my brain that says that that says, well, why can't I? When somebody says you can't, you won't, you shouldn't. I've always had that little part of my brain that says I will, I can, and I'll show you. And sometimes that's got me in trouble. Sometimes that's made me make decisions that I probably didn't didn't um get what i wanted from but but ultimately that you know that that point in my life was was uh was i think the making of me if if that yeah. makes sense uh, absolutely and you know the great michael jordan once said i always turn negatives into positives there's a great yeah. example of turning a negative situation yeah. into a positive one i mean because you've got what would be classed as a disability there you know it, it, are you mindful of that in terms of how you can you know, become um, 
aspiring for people with disabilities to to oh. to make the best of the hand that they're dealt in life and to keep pushing forward for the dreams. Yeah, listen, I'd I'd, I'd say whatever anybody gets from what I've done is 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 up to them, and I'd you know I would. I talk to anybody. I talk to. I used to laugh actually when I was working at Leeds. I'd get the bad lads, I'd get the big lads, uh, and I'd get the people that were struggling with with whatever physical ailment they had. And and those were the people that used to come to the club and say, "Can you come and talk to my son or or, or my brother or my daughter if if it was if it was that way?" But I just do my own thing. I, it's never held me back. There are there are times in my life where it, it probably has been the reason for some things but I then also go a step backwards and think about my own decisions leading up to that and um, it's never held me back and I would say if you, if you were to define a disability it's never been a disability it's never it's never stopped me from doing anything so I don't look at it and and if other people want to get into a conversation about that, then then that's fine. But what I would say to anybody, and this is this is anybody that 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 chooses to listen to this, you if you want something hard enough, if you if you truly have a desire to do something, then go and do it. Yeah, absolutely, brilliant stuff. You signed obviously for Oldham, you're an Oldham lad. Um, proud moment that I would have thought, you know, to play for you, for Oldham. Um, you know, proud moment for you, your family. Absolutely, and and. Um, Representing Oldham at that time was was an honour. They'd you know they'd probably somewhere somewhere similar to where Wakefield and Cass are now, maybe Featherstone as well. A, yeah. a, a strong old in terms of producing rugby players, a, a really thriving strong amateur uh, amateur scene, and um, to play for Oldham, they just got relegated that that year. To play for Oldham was an honour. It wasn't anything that was on my radar actually. I was going to play Waterhead. I was going to play. You know, amateur rugby and, and get on and be a builder, be a joiner. But um, I went on a barley tour to New Zealand, played against Stephen Kane and Ruben Wickey over in um, Auckland and on the South Island there um, as 17, 18 year old. Um, played with players like Darren Fleary, Paul Anderson, David Bradbury, Terry O'Connor, of course, just, just to name a few. So we had a really, really good side. I got I got a sort of provisional offer before I went, came back, signed it, and then did three really enjoyable years with Oldham. And it was it was frustrating at the end because I wanted more. I wanted to go through this career of mine. Once I'd got on the treadmill, I wanted to go through and win things. I wanted to represent my country. I wanted to tour. I wanted to be somebody that could look back and be proud and not just be, you know, a process of I work during the week and I top it up with you know, the, the money that we were playing for them would have been a couple of hundred quid. It was a top up in some people's mind. But for me, I didn't care about the money. I wanted to win. I wanted to be on, on the big stage and be in, be in those big occasions. So three three years at Oldham, really enjoyed it. Met, met some great people who gave me some some gems of advice that, that I carried on and passed on to the generation below me when I could. So I was grateful and always will be grateful to Oldham. I'm, I'm thrilled to see them back in the positive now. They've got some good people behind them at last. So the people that are running it are, are aspirational. They're giving Oldham kids a go. They're, they're getting in touch and, and engaging with the, the community club. So, so Mike Ford and his consortium have everybody's support. Absolutely, absolutely, and you know your your development into the game, lower levels coming up. Um, it's hard. It appears from the outside looking in a bit harder now. With you, Reg, you know the the likes of your Wiggins, your lead, the ones who've got a big pool of reserves. They, of course, have got the dual Reg going on. A big year this for some of those London London lads because you know James Meadows, brilliant last year for Batley, outstanding. Alex Walker, such a shame. Uh, Billy Leyland is out for the season. I was really looking forward to seeing him uh, for London this year. Um, you know, for me, I've been quite steadily impressed by London. You know, they're battling hard. They're not, they're not giving up. They're not throwing towels in. Would you expect a couple of those lads to be picked up at the end of the season uh, and remain in Super League? Listen, I'd like to see London thrive. I'm one of them. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I contradict myself because I'm a traditionalist from a from a heartland town who wants to see Oldham do well. But yeah, I, I've you know I've. A, a strong affinity with London, London teams. I played against London Broncos, London Crusaders. They were back in, back in the very beginning. So all, all that we need to do is, is, 
it, and, and it, people have said it for a long time, just just put roots down and give it a 10 or 12 year bedding in period and, and try and build on those foundations. I wouldn't like to see anybody leave London. I'd like to see Londoners play for London. I'd like to see, yeah. much like myself, much like the, the lads that play for St. Jude's and St. Pat's, they grow up and they want to play for Wigan. You know, I'd love to see London. And, and when we say London, I don't just mean the city of London. I'm, I mean that that's that southern district there. I'd love to see all roads leave to the Broncos and Mike McMeekin, yeah. um, Louis McCarthy Scars, but just to name a few, just two lads yeah. that come to mind there. You know, how how different would the Broncos be if 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 they'd have been there or, or the Harlequins as it was a couple of years ago? How strong would they be if they'd have, have kept within that system and brought the new new kids forward? So what I've seen with the Broncos this year is is they've started a very slow, steady incline in performances. And if they keep going like that, I think they'll pick up a win. They should have won against Full FC. Let's yeah, let's be right sure. there. Should have won against Full FC. But that's a lesson in itself. You've got to go right till the 80 minutes. You can't afford to think we've got this game and, and mentally clock off because people, I think it was Morgan Smith, who ironically used to play for the London Broncos. Morgan Smith saw an opportunity, a couple of minutes on the clock, and and they managed to get to get the win. So I want to see London thrive. I want to see yeah. Catalan thrive. I yeah. think it's madness, madness that Catalan are penalised. And, and I, I do hope they have a rethink about the um the the proposal for for Catalan to pay for their opposition to come and, and all those travel expe I think that's crackers. Uh, we've got to support those those outposts as much as we can. I'd love to see a Cumbrian team. I'd yeah, love to see a Blues in. You know, I'd love to see a Welsh team in uh, as well somewhere. But we so can't... on that on that basis, then Buzz, we need a fourteen team Super League, don't we? I mean, are you, are you in that camp? Get rid of the Luke fixture and get a fourteen team going. I, I am, but but I don't have to sign the checks. I'm not somebody at at uh, somewhere like Castleford trying to balance the books with with minimal input from sponsors and and stuff like that. So I understand why it it never gets it never gets off the page really. But the common sense part of my understanding of the game says it's it's a fourteen team competition. Then there's no loop fixtures. We'll stick a magic week in there as a one off and. And, and we'll just get on with it and look normal. I think sometimes we tie ourselves in knots just to accommodate the clubs because we're club-centric, club-led, and not governing body-led. I'd like to see the governing body govern and 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 set the agenda and tell everyone else what they're doing and not get led by the important people in the important clubs. I think, I mean, again, from the, you know, just as a, as a fan, I think we're starting to see the IMG bit now. I think the razzmatazz around the launch this year, it felt different, it feels different. I think you can see on social media that the clubs have really upped the game in terms of their engagement with the fans, some of the video production that they're putting out there, some of the trailers that, that they're putting out there as well. Um, you know, this is, this is a massive moment, as we've already said, for the sport. Um, Magic Weekend, of all the things that IMG have done for me, I just don't understand why magic is a question mark. You know, you you work for Sky. It's a it's a brilliant festival of rugby league, the Magic Weekend. It's got to stay, surely. I've been lucky enough to been to all to beat. Sorry, I'll start again. I have been lucky to have been at all of them. They're all unique. They're all different. Obviously, we've had quite a few of them at, at Newcastle, and the the glitch in the system is the time of year that it's been bumped to. So August is right on the cusp of the football season. Yeah. So football teams don't necessarily want um, a festival of rugby league on their turf. So so my question is, why is it in August? We've not had too much information around it. But if there's a genuine reason why we're in August, um, I, I'm looking forward to Ellen Road. I think Ellen Road will be, will be an exciting change. And, and don't forget, as well as it being for fans, uh, the, the players the players get excited about playing in these big stadiums because it's an occasion. Not everybody is lucky enough to play at an Old Trafford or or Wembley or Tottenham, whatever it was the, a couple of years ago. So to be in a big stadium and to be in the in the in the big occasion, players rise to it. So the the point you made about IMG not understanding it, not buying into it, I think we've got to show them what the game can provide. It, Last year at Newcastle, it felt like it was a bit tired. It felt like it was probably just the you know maybe one year too long, and we should have had a move. So I'm sure the people at Ellen Road and 
and everybody around Leeds will will want to make it a memorable experience for everybody. So, yeah. so I, I'm glad that it's in there, and and I you know I would urge fans to go go to Ellen Road, give it a, give it a shot, give it a chance, and and try and watch another game, not just your own fixture. Well, I'm I'm going for the full weekend. You won't expect anything less. Tickets are booked, accommodation is booked. I cannot wait. Uh, going back to that debut at Oldham, um, obviously. We, we've only got a limited amount of time. We might have to bring Baz back because I'm just letting the conversation flow. But you lined up that day alongside one Mr. Darrell Powell. Um, in, in terms of that, Warrington, Wakefield. Um, Warrington got a bit sour there uh, in the end. Uh, you know, I think everybody expected Darrell to go in and do a really good job and was delighted that he got the gig. Didn't work out well. And now, of course, he's got this opportunity at, at Wakefield. He would have been surprised to have gone out the Challenge Cup though, at the weekend to Feb, let's be fair. Uh, but but Darrell, I mean, any any thoughts on, on Darrell's current coaching career the last 12, 12 months? I think, Paula, from my experience, as the understanding now, he's got the 10,000 hours booked in. Paul Roll is the, the person on everybody's lips now because he's doing exceptional things yeah. with a with a with a and this is not meant to be unkind, it's a it's a team of players that are exceeding the potential. Let's put it that way. I'm pleased with yeah. myself. I haven't offended anybody there. They are playing well above their potential. And I think that's coach led. I think Pauli's strength is a little bit of that. You yeah. know, he can he can deal with a, a team like when I played uh, under him at Leeds, he can deal with a team, Featherston team, a cast team, and he can get them playing out of the skin. It's a very different sk- uh, skill getting a team of exceptional players to play as a unit, to understand that the collective is more important than your individual. As I watched it, I'm looking at it thinking, you just need to get everybody on the same page. It's not a case of getting George Williams to play better or Ben Curry to play better. It's getting them to play as a unit. And that's not to say that those individuals are selfish. Players under stress and under fatigue just revert to type. They just do what they've always done. And that that was the trouble I thought, and that for me it's not it's not it's shown on the eighty minutes, but that's not where it starts. It's it's that it's that environment. It's that it's that word that everybody uses, culture. Yeah. Culture isn't isn't an overnight thing. It can take a year, two years, three years to get to get somewhere. If we look at the the people that have been really really successful in our sport, they've either inherited a good culture or they've fostered their own culture, cultivated it. And that process has taken a long time. So, um, well, on that, Barry, on, on that point, Barry, when you went to Leeds, Tony Smith's done that throughout his career, hasn't he? He goes to clubs, he develops a culture. He did it. He did it at Leeds. He did it at Warrington. Um, is that he what you're talking about? Football, no, he ne- I would, I would say all day, every day that he inherited Daryl Powell's culture. Daryl Powell's right. Okay. Powell, Inherited, so he has a chronological look. Yeah, yeah. He inherited, he inherited Dean Lance's culture. Dean Lance inherited um, Graham Murray's culture. Graham Murray's culture was brilliant, but because we were successful, everybody scarpered, including Graham Murray. Dean Lance couldn't keep it, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't manage it, couldn't handle it, and it deteriorated. Powerly built it back up. Tony Smith inherited some good pros, some hungry people. Uh, and then a good crop of young kids, and he just got the best out of that. So what I think Smith is really good at getting good players to be exceptional, and his 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 ultimate skill is is that holistic look at the club, and he can he can look at what needs doing on a day to day basis to to make the club as a whole improve. And and he he did that at Warrington. You could argue that of the three was he three grand finals, three losses yeah. each. Should have got one of them. Yeah, um, he should have got at least one of them. But once you get one, it's 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 getting over that first hurdle. And I know that from my own experience. We won it in all four. We were a bit short in all five. There was a bit of a dip for a, a year or two, but then the rhinos went on and won it yeah. virtually every year for about ten years, didn't they? So yeah. So going back to the to the Pauli question, I think Pauli himself will just take a step backwards probably remind himself what he's good at and then he'll come back up because his passion and his drive for the game is second to none. So people who've been involved in the sport like Paul since he was 17, 18, 19 years of age, it's 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 many, many decades. So you could get tired. You could get 
you could get to a phase where you just take things for granted and it, it's it's a little bit of, you know, well, we don't have to focus on on those things because the lads know how to do it. And I, I, I had a very short spell um, in the coaching environment. And what I understood is you can never assume that players... Um, would know would know the simple basic things so you have to reinforce that on a day to day basis makes sense makes sense um in terms of wakefield could they be the next lee i mean it looks very lee esque in terms of they've got the the um the ground sorted his recruitment strategy is bringing in at championship level quality players rumors massive rumors mike mcmeekin could be there next year tom johnston could be returning there next year how true they are we'll find out in the you know, in the balance of time, Darrell Alfords, of course, has, has gone over there this week. Um, could this be another league when they do come back to oh, Super League? I'd expect them to get a licence next year to, to play in Super League based on what they've done off the field and on. Uh, could they be, again, because what we want is the competition to get stronger and more competitive. It's going to be a far stronger and competitive Wakefield Trinity that returns to Super League, you'd hope, wouldn't you? I think they could do what Lee have done. And, and were Lee were different than, than others that had come on. Is they had a they had a quality stadium, they had a good infrastructure, strong community game, and I think that's probably the blueprint that Wakefield need to follow. Get your get your stadium up to standard. Of course, everybody judges teams on what they do on a on a on an eighty minutes on a weekend, and that that is absolutely that's what you should look at and say whether a club's successful or not but very quickly then you start going down the list and you you start saying how many season tickets have they got what is the digital footprint like how many people actually care about the club still come to the club is there a place for them to go is the club proactive within the community and, and the amateur game and all the rest of it so so a lot of that is already set up it won't take too long for it to get I think back back engaged because you know I know from my experience in Oldham here now um people now when I say people talk about coaches who are, have got an under 14s team uh are, are going and doing their game on a Sunday morning and then saying right well what we'll do is then we'll go and watch the local team. That that's the best that's the best way to do it. Get those young people in the stand, get them watching the heroes, get them having a fantastic day, good experience, and then they they might not be the next Super League players, but what they'll do is they'll they'll grow that bottom of the pyramid, and and suddenly we've got more people, and we're more powerful, more relevant. There's more um, conversations taking place about rugby league than there is about the other sports that that awesome. everybody can go away and watch. Spot on, and like I say, it just grows the family, doesn't it? It grows the, the rugby league family. That that's what it does. Happy days. Right, let's uh, just a, a quick touch on your career. Like I say, we can't. Put it all into this interview. We might get Barry back uh, for another for round two at some point. Well, yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah, but it, well, hey, it's fascinating stuff to get your intake uh, on on the current climate, but also on your career. Ninety four Wigan come calling. Uh, that probably a pretty straightforward decision to go and join the Warriors at that stage of your career. I had a few different conversations. One of them was War Warrington. You'd be you'd be pleased to to know. I went to see Warrington. Went to see Saints. Went to see Leeds. Um, and had a had a, an exchange with Widness, but didn't go to see them. But Wigan, um, I wanted to be a one club man. I think loyalty is pretty high on my list of of characteristics, and and I wanted to be with Oldham for, for all my career. But after a couple of years, I I knew they were just happy just to survive, and that wasn't in my nature. So if I was gonna go, I wanted to go to the best. And I walked in the dressing room at Wigan. I'd played against a lot of the younger players all the way through, and I'd. I'd punched them, kicked them, bit them, scratched them. I'd done everything. So so I didn't have too many friends in that changing room. But O'Connor and myself signed at more or less the same time. We stuck together. Scott Quinnell, the rugby union player, came over. So the three of us were very tight. We were all competing um, for the same position, really, with Kelvin Skerritt and Neil Cowie and, and one or two others. And, and we just we just thrived off, off the environment. I, I wouldn't say it suited... My my nature or my character, but I learned so much um, over the twelve months, fourteen months that I was at Wigan, and I do. I'm grateful for the fact that they biffed me out the door. I am. I'm grateful for the fact because I found. So why did Why did you mention that? So why why did the, why did, why was your ex exited stage stage left um, at Wigan? Well, I wanted to play every week. I wasn't yeah. guaranteed my spot. Um, when I got injured, I didn't I didn't handle that correctly. I was a young twenty two year old man who 
who didn't know the you know the do's and don'ts of the full time professional era made a whole raft of mistakes. Um, people were were slowly sort of whispering in my ear, but I didn't have a I didn't have a proper mentor that were pulling me one side and said, "Come on, you know, focus on on your training. Stop doing this. Stop doing that." So so when I went to Leeds, it was something I tried to be for other players. I'd watch out for somebody that were going down a a, a toxic route, and I, and I try and try and um, help them. But yeah, I think it was just a collection of a, a few things, most of them off the field. And um, Wigan's just churns them out, doesn't it? And if if you're not up to scratch, they'll biff you off because they've got another six or seven behind you. I'm mean, right. I think. I mean, again, I've tried my best to get get the research right. I'm mean, right. I think your debut was the World Club Challenge. Uh, is this Wigan? Uh, no, no. No? Did you play from no. before that? Uh, the World Club Challenge over in Brisbane. In Brisbane, Ter ANZ, yeah. Uh, Terry, Terry O'Connor and myself were signed, but our registration didn't come into play until it would have been the September then, because we were right. in winter season. So so I played on the first game. I can't even remember who it was. Sheffield, maybe? Was Sheffield. Uh, I know Sheffield was old. Yeah. yeah was it uh, Sheffield again? Don't know, don't know. Well, you did, you did play in that World Cup Challenge in the end, Ed, didn't you? No. Did you not? Did you not get into that one? I thought you did. No, no. no. Oh, we, well, my apologies. Yeah. I thought you had. I thought you yeah, got into no, that one. It, it was a it was a bare bones team by Wigan. It was right. some achievement that because I think Mick Cassidy and Billy McGinty were were part of the front row rotation. The only recognised prop was Neil Cowan. Right. So 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 no. Me and Tez watched it in a pub in in Widnes in a, in a snooker club. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, oh well, you're a long way from the ANZ then. We did you yeah. did play did did you play in the Kangaroo Tour that that year though when the Aussies yes, come over? Yeah, you played I that played, one, didn't you? Yeah, I played against Australia where where Paul Cernan brutally assaulted my elbow, <laughs> uh, and then from that game I got picked. I got picked for Great Britain, which was yeah. which was another. I don't think international rugby league ever got as high as it did. On, on that day um, at Wembley, it never felt JD, the, same. the JD one at Wembley, the Jonathan yeah, Davis one, just unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah. The, the, if you if you if you wrote it down as a sequence of events, you'd start again because you'd think that's that's not believable. That Sean Edwards got sent off, um, tight attritional game. I played one hour because um, I was on the bench and I'd been suspended from the Paul Cern and thing, so. Came on off the bench, played an hour of the most intense, the quickest, the most physical, the most mentally and emotionally demanding game of my life. And, and we come out on the right side of it. And it was a seminal moment in my career. And I never forgot some of the things that happened that day, happened to me. And I always used to think when I felt like I was in a rut or it was tough or a game was tough, I used to think it's not as tough as it was on that day. And we came out of the other side and it's... It's um, an experience I'll, I'll carry with me for the rest of my life. That cameo Jonathan Davis did in rugby league that uh, around that time, he was a he was a player JD, wasn't he? He was the he was the best broken field runner, and and I think and Jiffy will Jiffy will, I'll admit to this because he's a good lad, Jiffy, with a great sense of humour. A lot of his game was on fear. You know, Martin Afire would have been similar. They they were they were playing on fear a lot of the time because they were surrounded by big horrible monsters that just wanted to get hold of them and punch them and and they were so evasive, so quick, so skillful, gliding in and out of tackles because they didn't want to get hit. Now that's not to say that they weren't brave and and they were cowardly. They were very very brave, tough players in their own right. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's. We don't get the same crossover of rugby union lads now, and it's a great shame. I think yeah. if we were if we were ever to focus on some of the 12, 13, 6, 7, those are the numbers, um, but the centres and back rows in terms of positions, if we if we focused on some of those lads in their, in their early 20s, I reckon we'd get some real gems, mate. No, absolutely. No, 100%. Um, yeah, but like I say, great, great, great game, historic game. That one uh, for Great Britain was that. How, where does that rank in your highlights of your career? Because obviously you've had a great career. One minute you've won yeah, trophies. Is that the top? Is it? It was top for a number of reasons, but basically I'd I'd only just sort of got into that big time. It was the biggest stage I'd ever been on, playing with and against heroes and idols of mine, people who I'd only watched on TV. Because back in those days, everyone used to pass around the micron videotapes of. 
yeah, of the Winfield right. Cup as it was then. So yeah. I'm playing against Mal Meninga and for me, in my position, it was Ian Roberts, Paul Harrigan, Dean Pay, Glenn Lazarus, lads who uh, you know, were just iconic rugby players and I'd only ever read or watched them on TV and to be on the same field as them was, was unbelievable. And then to be given the chance to beat them up, whack them and send them home with with a with a, a defeat was just unreal. So I loved it. Yeah, no, happy days. Uh, I'm right in thinking that year, Eagle Trophy uh, came Wiggins where you played that day in, in yeah. the final. Uh, was yeah. that your first piece of silverware as a professional, the Regal Trophy? I think so, yeah, I think yeah. so. Um, yeah. Do we miss that? Pieces. Do you miss the Regal Trophy? It had a, at the time, it was it was great. I miss I miss the different versions of different teams to get in a final. So we had the, the Lancashire and Yorkshire Cup. We had yeah. obviously the Regal Trophy and the Challenge Cup. There'd be there'd be three or four things for for teams to go at. There's there's only there's only two now in effect, isn't there? At top level, and if you get one of those two, then you get the chance to go for the third one. So, yeah, yeah I think we 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 rightfully limit the amount of games to focus on intensity and quality. Um, but I, but I'm a big fan of the 1895 Cup. I love to yeah. see those those games and those teams and those players get the chance to experience the big time. But Regal Trophy at what was the Gal final, it's the John Smith Stadium now, and we played against Warrington, and on my victory lap, I'm applauding the audience, thinking, yeah, they're all pleased for me because I've won my first one, and I mistakenly walked past the Warrington fans and I got a big snowball <laughs> right in my mush. <laughs> right, on the, right on the conk it was, and I was like looking round to try and find who it was, but there was about 5,000 fans all giving me the V sign. Let's be honest. Not many Wigan players were like back in the day uh, oh, in, in during that period of time. So I don't, it might not have been personal. It might have just been the, the colour of the shirt that you were wearing. It was a new experience for me because I'd been yeah. one of the fans yeah. throwing because I grew up hating yeah. Wigan because all Wigan yeah. ever did the trophies. Yeah. They won the Challenge Cup eight times, didn't they, on the bone yeah. or whatever it was. So yeah. when I joined Wigan, it was through gritty teeth, but I joined to win. And when I had one, I didn't I didn't I didn't automatically understand that I became part of that category that everybody hated. No, happy days, happy days. So obviously off to Leeds you go. Uh, we've already said the rivalry at the time, Bradford Bulls Leeds for a period of time there, uh, was it was brutal. I mean, those games were, were absolutely brutal. Um obviously you played with Moz, uh, Moz before he went off to, to the NRL. Um I mean again, because Moz was a pack member, when he went down down under, I'm sure like many people you kept an eye on what he was doing, he, he, he tore up the NRL, didn't he? Of course he did, yeah and I'm st I'm still really, really good mates with him um, and, and I was back then, I was ringing him up and I kept, it's funny actually, I kept saying to him you know, you need to get hold of the ball Moss, the, the, the probably knew at the front when it comes time to defend but back in his early days, he was a back rower, he was a good edge line runner um, good hands. He had a pass in him, but he was, you know, he was just a line breaker, yeah. and, uh, and 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 a, and a game breaker as well. Moz, when it when he was in his his youth, and, and they turned him into this machine of just big shot after big shot after big shot. And he, he he's like me, he loves it. He loves the physicality of it. So he was saying, as long as he was saying to me, as long as I get picked, I'm not bothered, and I'm going and I'm going to him. But there's two sides of the ball, Moz, and. You know, although it's great doing all these tackles, it's you know you want to get you want to get your kicks, don't you? But of course, he's he's still revered in in um, Sydney to to some tune, and occasionally I'll I listen to the some of the NRL stuff. It might be the Johns, Matty Johns show. Yeah. Or, you know, I have conversations with Gordon as we did. I think it was last year when Gordon came. No, the year before when Gordon came over and we did some stuff with Terry O'Connor. You know, he talked about Moz and he talked about everybody fearing Moz and, and talking about him all the time. So to be with him as a young kid, we were from similar backgrounds. We had a similar character. We loved a laugh. We, you know, we loved a few cheeky pints as well. So so we got on well and we still do. Yeah, I've heard many a story of Moz's uh, nights out on the lash. We'll leave them there for this one. Um, uh, in terms of Gary Schofield, he was there. Now, you know, he is a pantomime really in rugby league. Let's be fair, he's Mr Schofield. But it's unquestionable. He was a class player. Uh, what what was it like to to play in your early days at Leeds with Gary Schofield? 
Scully at that time was was battling with anybody and everybody he could. Ellery would was with Ellery's shadow at Leeds at that time was still there. He wasn't technically signed on as a player. He was as he was trying to play for. I think it would have been Balmain, um, trying to get back over to Balmain, but he hadn't. He was still in the country. So Scully was an unusual character. Um, I'd say five years prior to me ar arriving. So from eighty eight to ninety two. Gary Schofield was the best player in the world, without a doubt, because Scoy, um, as a Great Britain player, was was unrivaled, unparalleled to me. He, he was one of the players that, when he wore a Great Britain shirt, got better. Yeah, uh, and that might have been, on the big stage. Yeah, I mean, it might have been the fact that when he was a Leeds player, he he was having to compensate for the players that are around him that that perhaps weren't up to his standard, but when he played for Great Britain, he was he was amongst players who were as good as him and he he, he grew about 10 or 15% better. So I wasn't there long enough to get a good gauge on score. Um, but it's un, un, undoubted to me how much of an influence he had on on the the environment, the club, the changing room. And it, it was just a shame. He, he didn't, he wasn't ever part of a, a trophy lifting team. And I know that that bothers him now and, yeah. It, I think it would bother me if I went through my career and, and didn't manage to lift any silverware. Yeah, and you know, we spoke about uh, the JD try. It, it, it'll always go down as one of the best international tries that's ever been scored. Uh, yeah. Gary Schofield, he's got that on his CV, hasn't he? I've got, for, forgive me, uh, Super League Raw fans who watch this, I don't normally uh, use interviews for my, own, for my own pleasure, but I'm going to. One of my childhood heroes played with Barry McDermott, a man called Gary Mercer, who I thought was a sensational second rower. Uh, I was broken hearted when he left Warrington to go to Leeds. He was one of my firm favourites. So I'm just going to have to ask you, Gary Mercer, the man, the player, what was he like? Great lad. So Ming was his nickname. For those people who can remember Flash Gordon, Ming the Merciless had a, had a sort of haircut like that. Yeah. That was Ming's haircut. So we all called him Ming. Part of a group of Kiwis at the time. We had a senior for Milo, George Mann, Tony Kemp, Kevin Iro, some some great lads. But Ming was was somebody who spent a lot of time with the younger players. Very fit, very competitive. And although he wasn't a great, I don't think he was a great bloke in the gym in terms of lifting weights. He'd always push himself to the limit. If it was wrestling, he'd always grab hold of a big fella. He was like a mosquito in my ear a lot wanting to train with me, but um, still involved in rugby, although it's rugby union. Zach Mercer, his son, he's playing some good stuff. Um, played England a couple of times, Zach, even though he qualified for England and Scotland. But I still keep in touch with Ming. I, I run the ex-players group. I'm on the, the Rhinos ex-players committee and, and try and be the liaison between the older blokes and the 90s, noughties and, and, a, and, uh, and a little bit beyond that. And... Uh, Ming ran the half marathon last year for the Rob Burrow. Um, oh, marathon. So, so he's still fit. He's still jibber jabber all the time. Just still, just out. There's nothing going in. It's just out, out, out. But yeah. in a game, um, although he was a sidewinder, weren't he? You'll remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he, he was he, yeah. sideways than he did forwards. Yeah. I loved yeah. having him in the same team as me. He was a great. He was a great teammate to have. Yeah, he was one of my favourites. Dwayne Mann was another. I loved Dwayne Mann, but you know, Gary in my childhood, and of course the, the late great Desi Drummond as well. Uh, but yeah, when you see Gary, you know, just let him know he's not forgotten. You know, you you, you retired pros, we still remember you. Gary was a brilliant, brilliant player. I loved him. Right, nineteen ninety nine, childhood dream comes true. Challenge Cup final, Wembley Stadium. I mean, as a rugby league purist, Barry, some of you you know grew up in rugby league. This. You know, even, I, I'm not even, you know, I'm a fan. And every time I talk about Challenge Cups, I get goosebumps and I've, I've not experienced the atmosphere, the national anthem or anything. You know, you know, the Challenge Cup, if the NRL do buy Super League, question, question, we cannot lose the Challenge Cup. The relationship with the Rugby Football League, we cannot lose the Challenge Cup. It's got far too much history. Walkers, you know, just, we're, I love asking these questions. Challenge Cup final day, 1999. Tell, tell me about it. It was an unbelievable experience. Five years after I'd played there for Great Britain, so the, yeah. the stadium wasn't wasn't a strange one to me. The occasion I'd, I'd been as a spectator, a lot like you know, 
players who play there will often say, I've been here a couple of times, I've watched it, I wanted to be part of it. Well, I did. I'd watched Wigan lift that trophy a number of times. That year, 99, I mentioned Graham Murray. Graham Murray came in in 98. We'd been beaten by Wigan in the first grand final. We drew Wigan in the first round of the Challenge Cup. We beat them. We then played Saints. We beat them. We played Widnes, who were in the division below, beat them. Played Bradford in the semi-final, who we played three times, sorry, twice prior to that. And on the third time we beat them, we got through to the final and played the London Broncos. Um, Richard Branson was was sort of the yeah. spear, um, the figurehead, should I say? Uh, so it was all it was all brilliant. Eighty thousand fans. We were in our minds just going to turn up win the game and, and that would have been it. But but the Broncos had players like Sean Edwards, Martin Afire, other other top grade NRL players. And uh, they took the lead. They they had us under the cosh for the first 20 minutes. We came back, scored a try just before half time and five minutes or ten minutes after half time, I came back on for my second stint, got the ball, sidestepped and and scored a try, which was was as we look back on it now was the straw that brought the camels back. The way that I describe it, it was the match winning try. <laughs> Forget Leroy Rivette's four four tries on the day. But from about 60 minutes onwards, there's not often in, in big games, maybe, maybe 65 minutes onwards, there's not many times in big games where you can enjoy it. And we could enjoy it because we knew we'd won. And um, Leroy, he had, a, he, had a, he had a day out, didn't he? He scored four tries and... And um, it was a it was a, a day he'll never forget. Ryan Sheridan was good on the day. Yes, Dan Harris was good on the day. Moores, I think, had a great game. We, we had a gang of of lads who'd been through the mill a bit. So that journey that I talk about, that culture, started to be driven in in the beginning of '98. By the time we got to midway through '99, we were there, and we would have you know we would have fought really hard for one and. The, for one another, and we did on a regular basis, and and um, it was a it was a point in our development as a team that we should have gone through to the grand final in '99, but you know we we didn't quite get there. But um, you know that that experience was unbelievable. It was it was everything I thought it would be. It was everything I wanted it to be. My son was the mascot. All my family went down, and um, yeah, I'll I'll never forget that one either. That's right up there with the Great Britain. Uh, in and I think that, that you know that's probably where we start to see the golden generation, the '99, because of Keith Senior comes into the squad, Kev Sinfield comes into the squad. Uh, the year after, uh, Bradford get their own back at Wembley on you, uh, which was which was interesting. They they're not you they're not you out uh, in the final. Um, just going to fast forward. We'll go back to Leeds in a minute. World Cup 2000 Ireland. Um, you know you you played alongside Terry Mack, uh, Tommy Martin, uh, Stevie Prescott. In that team, Mark Foster of Warrington Wolves, Brian Carney. It was like a, it was like a Sky Sports pre Sky Sports game. This Brian Carney, Terry Mack, and you, um, yeah. and Chris oh, joined. Oh, Terry Mack, Terry, Terry O'Connor, Terry O'Connor. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I know, yeah, no, I know Barry Mack, Terry McDonald. What, what am I doing, <laughs> Terry O'Connor? And uh, Chris joined, Chris joined yeah. as well. Um, you know, so some real proper, you know, hardened yeah. Super League players in that. And let's be fair. You did. You, I think you probably did better than many outsiders would have thought in that one. Beat Samoa. You beat Scotland. Uh, you bowed out against England in a in a good game. You know it was a good game. The England game, twenty six sixteen. Balanced that for for it was. Uh, for those who haven't watched it for the last fifteen minutes. It was it was real nip and tuck. England yeah. had a great team, and um, you're right to mention Chris Joyne, Tommy Martin, wonderful players. Um, but we had we had a, a couple of lads that went on to do really good things. They were state of origin players in Luke Rickardson, Kevin Campion, Danny Williams. Yeah. Uh, so we had some some quality. And the the coach the coaches at the time were Steve O'Neill and, and and Andy Kelly. And what they managed to do, and I, and I've never experienced it since. And I, and I, I'd be interested to know. And, and the good pals of mine, both Steve and Andy Kelly. Um, I'd be interested to know if they they when they dr drill down uh, uh, whether there was a method behind the madness or it was just a collection of, of of fortunate events. And what they did is they got a group together, forged a team spirit in a really short space of time, left the way that the game was played and the team worked up to the 
to the important players in the dressing room. And that meant we had ownership on what we were playing, how we were playing. We had belief in one another because there were some very, very good players. Steve Prescott, as I said, um, Brian Carnett. We had players who couldn't make the 17 that had international caps for, for other teams or they had NRL Super League appearances uh, and Super League Grand Final rings and all the rest of it. So we had we had a really good gang of, of lads and we were we were a bit of a, you know, like a rogues gallery really and we thrived on that. The England game was always the target. We always knew that we were going to get to the England game. One of the toughest games was against the New Zealand Maoris on a, on a Wednesday night. It was wet. Uh, and they, they, as you'd imagine, were were physical. They were big. They weren't, they weren't terribly skillful. But what they did is, that when they got all the, they, they, they beat you up. So it was a physical, physical game. I really, really enjoyed that game. And um, when I look back at the whole experience, it was, it was wonderful. And we've never managed to to capitalize on some of those outposts: Ireland, Scotland, Wales, yeah. and. If we if we ever have the the vision to set up a long term plan, we've got to look at those rugby union strongholds and find a place for those people that aren't six foot eight, or they're not suited to the game the way that the the game is played now, and and give them an outlet which is our sport. Yeah, Mike McMeekin said that he you know he he started at Union and he said that he was better better equipped for for league and that's why he did it. Uh, you did him proud. You did the Emerald Isle proud. Right back to Leeds, two thousand one. Danny Maguire, Rob Burrow now come into the mix. So this golden generation is starting to is starting to take form. I mean, you know, you've already mentioned about the first time you saw Rob Danny Maguire as well. I mean, you'll have had an impact on them. You talked about you being a, a part of the leadership group in terms of, you know, you saw that as a, a big part of your role in that last stages of your, your Leeds career. You know, could, did you, did you foresee in 2001 when Rob came in, Danny, now, you know, you've got Keith senior in there who's pivotal at the time. You've also got Kev Sinfield, you know, could you have imagined at that point that they were going to go on? to, let's be fair, it's legacy status, what they've actually achieved in the game? I don't think anybody could have seen what they would achieve. I think what they managed to do and stay together while they were doing it is remarkable. And it's, it's doubt, doubt anybody will ever be able to do it again because of the the, the circumstances, the fortune, the, the good management, the additions to the squad. If I go through them, you, you, they talk about, the, the five of them, they talk about Ryan Bailey, yeah, Jamie yeah. Jones, Kev, Rob, and uh, Danny Maguire. If I go through the five of them, uh, Bailey was in the first team, and he he now he is the definition of a pantomime villain. Everybody that played against him wanted to get hold of him and give him a good hiding, but he managed to get under the skin of everybody and, and distract them to the point where they forgot that what they were supposed to do. Jamie Jones, Buchanan, 20-odd years he played for the Rhinos, should have retired three times that I know of with, with career threatening injuries, but his resilience and his persistence kept him on, on track. And then the big three that everybody remembers, Magsy developed over the period of his career from, from a poacher into a distributor and provider. Kev started off life as a back rower, then loose forward, then stand off. Then he could play anywhere in that back line and, was a master tactician. He was a coach on the field far before he was a coach off it. And then Rob was just the 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 enigma that that broke up every game. So everybody brought something different to to the table. But what they did do is they had passion for the club. They had belief in the direction that it was going. Gary did a great sales job on everybody that came in because people signed, and it was widely known that people signed for a lot less. I think. Me and Terry O'Connor, our our careers went side by side. He was always paid more than me, always paid more than me. But I wouldn't swap what I got and the benefits that I got and the fact that I still go back there and still see smiling faces and still, you know, to be inducted in the Hall of Fame and all these other things that I feel blessed and honoured to be part of. I'm glad that I sacrificed that, that, that extra cash to be part of history and part of that group. So, so no, I don't think anybody would have foreseen, but it was a privilege to see it at the beginning and, and witness it um, on the staff as, as when it was in its full, full flow. 
And whilst in your final season at Leeds, it wasn't the fairy tale ending. Let, let's not dwell on that. It's close to. It's close to. Because, uh, you know, in, in 2004, you finally get your grand final medal. Um, the, the first one, you say you broke the camel's back. There you go, lads. Now you go and, you go and create this legacy that you're going to do. We've, we've, we've got that first one over the line. And let's not forget as well, you won the World Club Championship as well. So, yeah. you know, even though the end of that season probably didn't finish the way you'd want it to, that end of 20, 2004, 2005, that little period there, you know, great way for you to sign off because you were coming to the back end of your career. It becomes a whole package. That's what what you do. You look back and and uh, three hundred and something games in this country uh, played for Y and Kangaroos over on the Central Coast. So, top level rugby league for sixteen, seventeen years. Everything that I wanted to win, I, I was lucky enough to 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 lift those trophies and and, and be part of those great occasions. A couple of times where we didn't quite get get the win, I, I'm all right with that. I don't mind. I, I, I never look back and think I wished I would have either been selected because there was two big finals I was left out of. Yeah. I don't look back and think, well, I wish I'd have played. It, it, I'm not I'm not unhappy with my lot. I'm grateful for my lot. I talked about potential before. My potential, nobody expected me to to do anything in the game. So everything that was was put on my head was was a negative. So to then turn around at the end and go, well, actually, I've got all these and I'm happy and and you know, my family have had some some fabulous experiences. We've been on life changing journeys with with different people who are lifelong friends, and and I'm and I'm blessed and I'm lucky. Two thousand and five. If we'd have probably gone on for another couple of minutes, we'd have got Bradford in that game, but it wasn't to be. And Bradford at that point, then that was probably the end of the dynasty. Yeah. Saints, maybe maybe Wigan for a couple of years, and then. Leeds went on that long run, so I believe in in the in the the universe. As I, as I said, I, I grew up a Catholic, so if it's not God that's in charge, somebody's in charge of something somewhere, and 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 things don't don't just happen. I think they happen for a reason. So I'm happy with what I've done, uh, and I was blessed to be to be part of that that club, Leeds Rhinos, that great club and that great culture for another ten years after. Learned more in those ten years than I did in the the previous ten playing, and uh, I feel like I've I've left my mark on on the club, and and I like to think I continue to leave my mark on the game as well, and, and give back in as many ways as I can. Absolutely, and and look, you know your career. Let's be fair; I'm not going to wrap it up, Barry. Yeah, you were the enemy in, throughout your your career, as far as I was concerned. I uh, but what I would... You've waited till the end, though, haven't you? What's that say? I said you've waited until the end. Yeah, no, but it gets better. It gets better because I say this to everybody that comes on. It takes two teams to to put on 80 minutes of entertainment for us supporters. And uh, I say this to every player that I have the privilege of speaking to. Thank you on behalf of every rugby league fan for what you put yourself through for our entertainment. It really, you know, I can't, I just can't give you guys more accolades than I do. You are heroes. You, you are heroes and uh, you deserve far more credit than you've got over the years. And uh, here at Super League Raw, we, we give you your due, mate. Outstanding, outstanding career. If you could go back to that Barry McDermott who has just lost his eye and whisper in his ear, what would you say? I'd say it's going to be okay. Yeah. Don't worry, it's going to be okay. And, and, I'm, and I'm, I don't think it could have worked out any better. And like I say, if I was given the option... I wouldn't go back because I wouldn't be here now. I wouldn't be lucky enough to be able to be part of uh, such a wonderful family. I've got those friendships. I've got those memories. I've got those experiences. And and myself and my family are grateful to the game and the people within it every single day. So, so listen, thank you for, for giving me the time and the opportunity. And I, and I would say to you, you just keep doing you. You just keep going and keep giving the people, however many it is, well, whether it's one or one hundred thousand, give them, give them, you know what they can't get access to, which is which is a, an hour with with people who are important to our game. So one hundred percent, mate. That's exactly that's exactly what it's what it's all about. Massive time this for the sport. Um, before we get on to you, one to thirteen, this IMG bit, um, it feels as a supporter that Sky have had a right kick up the backside. That's how it feels, because the coverage this season has gone up a gear. There's no doubt about that. I think the commentary's better. I think the fact, I think it's 
the fact that there's now a commentator and one and one as opposed to multiple, I think there's more focus on the game. I think that's been a criticism over the years that you know with too many on the gantry, it can almost detract from what. Whereas now, I think you know what we're what we're hearing is the commentator commentating, and the likes of yourself, Kyle Amor, and the, and the rest of the gang. You're commentating really specifically now on the game and the dynamics of the game. As that was that the intention? What because that's how it's coming across. I mean, it's a lot lot better this year than we've had in previous years. What what happened to create that? Uh, I'd be interested to know. Well, you'll forgive me. I'm going to phrase that differently. Go for um, it. I don't think that Sky have a kick. I've had a kick up the backside. I think there's a desire for Sky to help this game improve. There's a desire for the people that I work with to help the game improve. Six games over the course of the weekend takes some doing it, takes some commitment, and obviously there's there's money behind that. And um, what what the IMG stuff has managed to, um, to do is just to bring some more people to the table, bring some more, some more, I think, opinions, more expertise. It shouldn't be uh, a judgment on Sky. It's a, it's, a, it's a judgment on us all. Yeah. We've all contributed to, to to where we are at the minute. And I know that some of my friends that used to go week in, week out, have just got that way that they either don't watch the game or they watch it off a dodgy box, if we're all being honest. And mm-hmm. and uh, and that obviously just just I think just takes away from the the the, the quality of of product that Sky can supply because financially it doesn't make sense. To, to do it um, any other way. So I think we're all in it together. Yeah. And that's coming across. For, for it's everybody. coming across. Yeah. Um, in terms of the makeup of the games and the, and the we'd call it a one plus one, yeah, I, I, I think that works. I do. I yeah. think that works. And, and it, you know, the fact that we're all out at different games, we've all got one game to focus on. We've all got, you know, for, for a long time, it would be my week would be consumed with watching games and having knowledge and having having the data and having the 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 stuff that you bring up on a on a Friday and Saturday to tr- to try and give somebody something different. I think that helps the fact that everyone's got a different game. So yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. It can only it can only be a good thing that there's more rugby on TV. I have had people saying to me it's. It's hard work getting all those six games in, but as long as you've got the ability to watch it on your phone, you watch your game. I don't know what you're like, but on time I'm working on a Friday, I'm I'm watching the main game, but I'm flicking between the the the, the other one or the other two. Barry, please, on behalf of supporters, and I think I speak for mo- the, is, one of the main things the that comes up. What's that? Is this about the scores? Yes, please, because. When on Friday night, send it back. Don't tell us the scores because if if Sky want more more people to watch, I think they lose an audience because what people want to do is watch the game they pick on a Friday night, not know the score, and then straight after that watch the other as if it's live. And I think the viewing figures that Sky will get will be more. We're begging you, please, don't tell us the scores. Okay, so I'll take that back. Please, more scoreboards. Yeah, more no scoreboards. scores. More, 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 more scoreboards. No. You want more updates? That's what I've no. got. Knit down here, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no updates. No, 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 no updates. Okay. None at all. More updates. More scoreboards. No. Got it. Stop teasing me. Stop teasing me. You know what I'm saying. But no, honestly, I've really enjoyed the chat. Right, we're going to go you on to 13 and then we're going to let you go. Really appreciate your time. It's been re- it's been a privilege uh, to, to to speak to a legend of the game like yourself. Before we go to this one to 13, though, I just want to tell you this, because you've probably not watched it. Paul Rowley, he picked you in his front row of his all-time 13 yeah. that he's played with. And you know what he said? Yeah, it was you and actually Carl Harrison he picked. So you're in good company because he was a player and all. Um, and he described you as a big boy with leg speed and a step was in there as well. High praise. Yes. Well, with Mr. Rowley. Well, there's there's not many around now that watch me play, and not many around that watch me play live. But everybody thinks it was just about that. There no. was, there was, uh, yeah, there was some some other stuff in there as well. So no, that's nice of him. That's I'll nice, isn't it? You. you mentioned a bit about the bit. You mentioned a bit about your, your you know, your naughty side. But, but you know, like it, it, but yeah, legs, a leg speed. He said it was unusual to see such a big man with the leg speed and step that you had. So 
Nice. Right, so don't feel too much pressure to put him in at hooker. Uh, right, OK, let's go for Barry's 1-13. to 13. Starting at full-back, if you had to go on the field of play with the players that you play with in your career, who would you go, be going out with at number one? Well, my 1-13 to 13 re rarely changes. And, and I have to try and fit the players that I played with in the in the positions that I can. So, Yestin Harris played six, the produ most predominantly in his career, but... I've had to pick him at fullback because I've had to pick somebody else at six. But okay. Yestin, as I said, 98 was the best player in the game. Mercurial, tactically aware. Um, I, he had a, 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 a balance and footwork that deceived everybody. Everybody, when they were defending against him, would say, he's going to step, he's going to step. But they couldn't do anything about it. So, so Yestin Harris at fullback. Do you want me to go through it one to 13? No, so, so that's your fullback. Your two wingers. Who are you having on the wings? Two Wigan players, um, two players who, who probably, one came from Union, the other went to Union. Jason Robinson on one wing, small, low to the ground, a, a, acceleration was, was unreal. Um, could get to top speed in two or three steps. So Jason Robinson on one wing, the other one is a fire. A fire was was the the best goal scorer I think I've I've ever watched or witnessed and, and to play with him was a privilege. Play to play against him was a nightmare. And when he got older and he developed a pass and he's you know he's playing for London and Salford, it, it was it was the big boy's revenge because we could get hold of him then. But <laughs> I'd have him in I'd have him in my back line anytime. Yeah and let's be fair you, you don't see a challenge cup uh program without seeing the famous of fire tried here. Uh the yeah. two centres who are you putting in your centres? One of them can play full back. Uh, that's Gary Connolly. But I think he was one of the best players of his generation. Played um, in the NRL or, or uh, ARL as it was for, for Canterbury and, and was respected both sides of the world. And then the other one is the beast, Keith Senior. Uh, Keith was, was an unreal player and he doesn't, I don't think get the credit that he deserves, Keith, because he was he was big and powerful and he could run over the top of players. But later on, he he got a, a creative pass and he he could do that that role and that flick that that good centres has had. But in any big game, Keith would, would, would score a try, and then Gaz wasn't just good um, in attack; he was defensively. He was one of the best defenders in the back line I ever played with. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought Keith Senior was one of the best centres to ever grace the Super League field. I thought he was class, absolute class. You talk there about a pass. Do you get as excited as as I do? That um, Tim Lafay ball at the weekend. Because I'm not, obviously, I'm not a Salford fan. I was off the city. Absolutely wonderful skill. Yeah, and they're born on the training, training part. I think for those that watched the NRL Las Vegas games, there, there was a player, I don't know whether it was Joey Manu or the other centre, he did one similar, yeah. but it, I think that one probably went forward, really, but we, we don't get bogged down and stuff like that. But those skills are born out of practice on the on the training pitch and then and then a little bit of bravery and courage on a on a on a match day. Cause if if you get them wrong, you get hammered. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Who you who are you going in your half? Stand stand off. Half backs. One is a loose forward, but I'm picking him at six because he could. That's Kevin Sinfield. Kev. Yeah. The, well, he the played there for England, didn't he? Yeah, the most disciplined, the most dedicated, the most diligent professional I ever played with. And and from the age of about 14, he was only ever going to do great things. And then and then the little man, Rob Burrow. Um, Rob, I'd pick him at seven. Um, and, and I don't, it's not a sympathy vote. I played with great number sevens. I played with, you know, your Sean Edwards, Sean Longs. I played with Ryan Sheridan and, and, and lads who you probably think, you know, in terms of being an out and out seven, because Rob could play nine and did a lot off the bench. Um, Rob Rob's in there and in there on merit. Yeah, and two champion ch champion fellas. Um, you know, credit to credit to the game, but human being wise, I mean, well, I mean, I call him Sir Kev. He's he's yeah. and he is. I mean, if he if he's not the the first rugby league player to get a knighthood, then it's time to give up because yeah. he deserves it. I mean, what he has done. Uh, incredible, absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. Did you know? Yeah. Did you know? Obviously, he got awarded a, a CBE. Yeah. Didn't he? yeah, he did. Yeah, or he's an OBE, and I'm, yeah. I'm the third one in in the you know in the letters behind the name. It's it's Barry McDermott GBH for my full title. <laughs> and there was plenty of that. <laughs> I, knew, 
They don't they don't use it on Sky anymore. No, they should do. <laughs> Good man. Right, you uh, obviously you're one of the props, you're the captain. So you, you're picking yourself, that's the rule. So you have to you have to play in the game. You have to. That's the rules. So unless you have an injury in the warm up, you're 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 captaining in the front row. Who, who's who's your prop? I'm going to be injured this way. In fact, no, I'll probably be suspended because I like I always like to mention two lads that I played with and I love playing with them. My two favourite front rowers, Terry O'Connor, who who had a had a brilliant engine. And when you talk about reliability, when I looked at the side of him, I knew he wouldn't give up. And, and I loved playing with O'Connor. And sometimes he needed a ball of his own, let's be honest. But I yeah. loved playing with O'Connor. And I thought we had a synergy and an understanding that complemented each other. But my favourite Rhinos front rower was a guy called Darren Fleary. Um, Darren Fleary's peak was probably at the Rhinos. He played at Keithley, Dewsbury, Lee, a couple of other teams. But I loved having Daz because Daz loved defending. Short, stocky lad, big thighs, you know, twigs for calves. But Daz uh, uh, was was tough, was quiet, and would would rack up thirty five games. Uh, sorry, thirty five tackles in a game when it was hard to do thirty five tackles. Now they rack up. 40s, 50s and 60s, don't they? But yeah. as I felt like he would look after a lot of my work in defence and he would he would want me to do a lot of his work in, in attack. So I like I liked playing with Daz. So yeah. I'm suspended this week, so I'm, I'm picking them two in the front row. Nice balance, hooker. Terry Newton, best best hooker, you know, uh, tricky was 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 his skill. He was he was deceptive with the ball. He could give a nod and a wink and he had an offload. He could pop up, jump out. He had a, a real smart, accurate pass when it needed to be off the floor. It would be off the floor. As as a front rower, you want it in your hands, especially when you're near your own land line. You want it in your hands as, as soon as possible. And Tez was always good at differentiating when it was time to pick up and go and, and open up a space or you needed it quick because you, you were trying to do something for somebody else. So Newton at nine. Can I play your two second rowers? Two second rowers. It, it, it's one front rower and one back row. Uh, one front rower and one 13. So Paul Sculthorpe and uh, Adrian Morley. So Scully could play anywhere. Scully was a was a distributor, could run, run through a line. And um, those that know the game and followed his career know he probably... Finished the game early with an injury that that denied him that that status, that legendary status. But two, two Steve Prescott, Man of Steel, and when when the Aussies of our era talk about British players who they, they respected, Scully's always up there. So Scully on one side, and then Big Moz on the other. As I say, he was a a back row when I played against him. Sorry, when I played with him, yeah. But a reliable man, another bloke that. That had skill, that had speed, but could could dish it out if he needed to. Some second row that I always describe Paul Sculthorpe as a Rolls Royce of a player because he was just he, he, he was magical on a rugby field. He was, Paul a fair fair he was wasn't he? He was incredible. And who's your who's your number thirteen, Barry? Let you take your water, go on. Yeah, it won't surprise you. It, it's Faz. Yeah. Um, Faz is a he's a guy that could have played in the front row, could have played at six because he'd he'd a spell at everywhere. Um, yeah. Faz, he was. He was another one that was 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 um, versatile and and would offer different things in different positions. But I, I reckon that team at Texas unbeaten would never under the salary cap. You got no chance with the salary cap, oh, mate. Yeah. You got no, no. chance. Uh, but what? But what I want to and you know what I normally ask. I think it's the first time I've asked this question. Such is the team that you've just picked, and I think it just goes to show the quality of the player that you played alongside. Normally, I say, where would they finish in Super League? I'm going to go as far as to say, where would they finish in the NRL? All of them. All of them were. As a were side. All standard, and, and the majority of them would have played over there anyway. But if they, if, if you could put that team in their prime on the field this season in the NRL, where's it finishing? Easy. Top. top. Yeah. Some top. team that. And, and the quality players and, and the players that, that are ageless can play in any era. So, yeah. so no, I agree. 
I agree. Brilliant one to 13. Don't go anywhere. Don't do a Chris Hill on me. I said goodbye and Chris Hill just went straight off the screen. Don't do that. We'll have a little chat before we go. Uh, but look, I purposely stayed away. Uh, you can see here, this is a, Leeds, a, a Warrington supporter with a Leeds Rhino shirt, but you can see in the middle an embroidered wire. I saw the global sign. Yeah, so basically this is the Rob Burrow shirt. Uh, but you. as a Warrington fan, I had to embroider my Warrington badge on there. Um, um We've stayed away from. I've stayed away from 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 Rob and and from Kev because I know you're emotionally attached to it. We saw that at the testimonial game, and and that's not what this interview is all about. Um, we know without you saying what these people mean to you about, so we're not going to go there. But on behalf of the people who follow me uh, and myself, more importantly, um, best wishes to Rob. I think his wife, you know, International Women's Day was a couple of days ago. His wife, incredible. Absolutely incredible. Um, what a family. You know, the love that they've got. Incredible family. We wish Rob all the best. We wish Lindsay all the best. The kids all the best. Do give him our best regards. Let them know that, you know, no matter where in the rugby league community people are, uh, the love and respect that, that, that we're all pouring out to him. It's, it's there for all to, to they, see. They so. feel that, you know, they feel that from, so, so they're the part of two families, the, the, the rugby league family and the MND community, and they know that everybody holds them in the high, highest regard. Everybody has a warmth and a love for them that's really only reserved for the highest of the high. So yeah. you're right about Lindsay. She's the one that holds it all together. How she does it, I do not know. Yeah. But okay. um, the mum, the dad, Irene and Jeff, his two sisters, they're just a solid family that look after each other. Yeah. And Rob is still in there. You, you know, you look yeah. at him in his wheelchair and... His physical state is is jarring if you've not seen him for a while. I like, yeah. try to see him um, on a on a regular basis. I text him every every you know every couple of days because because we still have that communication, we still have that chat, we still have, have that banter. Um, anybody that's that's read his book knows that 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 his character is still in there. Yeah, I love the podcast as I was telling yeah. you. His podcast is brilliant. It is. Brilliant. We're just yeah. about to record. Um, a second series because Brilliant. it's been that well received and he obviously had some significant people on it because it's not just our family and the MND community that 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 know about him. I was I was at something I was at an expo yesterday and um I was stood near um so Black Sheep Brewery brought out a Burroughs blonde beer and I was stood with it because I was just trying to show my support for an hour and see if see if there was anybody that wanted to chat. And this girl came up and she had an American friend with her and they were having a conversation about Rob. They started going on about rugby, but this but this lady was from Somerset and she was up coming to the expo. And I thought that is the reach that yeah. Rob have, have managed to give to not only um, uh, his family, but 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 with the M&D cause. So he feels that love. I'll pass it on, but... Um, yeah. And and also to and also to yourself, Baz, and all of his mates as well. You know, uh, we're we're there with you. We're, we're absolutely there with you. And uh, champion fellow. And like I said earlier in the interview, yes, Rob has been incredible in the way he's fighted this disease and what him and Kev have done uh, as a collective. But you know, let's never forget that Rob Burrow, the rugby league player, was an incredible rugby league player. That is equal to the legacy he's going to. I mean, he would say his legacy in MND will probably be the greatest one uh, in his lifetime. But by God, he's left a legacy on the rugby league field as well. So do pass on our love and best wishes. Barry, it's been a pleasure, mate. Absolutely, you know, to have a chat about rugby league for an hour and a half. We're all in our element. Great, great stuff. Uh, keep uh, fighting the good fight. Remember, no scores. Have a word. And uh, yeah, Barry, uh, enjoy the rest of the season. I know you will. And thanks for joining me on In Conversation. Okay, take care. God bless. See ya.